Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyana Muhammad Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam Amma ba'd Ahabatithillah As we finished uh, Al-Rasul al The next thing that we will Study is this short hadith collection or a hadith collection which is similar to Arba'in and Nawawi and it contains hadith of Bukhari and Muslim and it was compiled by a brother named Samih Strach may Allah preserve him and bless him for his putting this short treatise together so this collection of hadith, as I said, it comes from Bukhari and Muslim. And the first hadith begins it's talking about the intention. And it is similar to the way many of the muhaddithin, they began their books uh, with this hadith. Because this hadith shows us one of the conditions for having our deeds accepted. And there are two conditions for having our deeds accepted. One of them is that we have a pure intention. You know, that we have ikhlas lillah, that we, whatever act of worship we're doing, it is uh, directed solely to Allah for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whether it be salat, whether it be dua, whether it be zakat, whether it be fasting Ramadan, whether it be hajj or umrah, all of those things are acts of ibadah. And this hadith will illustrate for that, uh, that for us. Likewise, or in addition to the second condition, is that whatever we do, <coughs> that it's in accordance with the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So to have our deeds accepted, there are two conditions. One is sincerity to Allah, and the second one is that it's in accordance with the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Meaning, any deed that we do, it is a uh, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa taala, and it is according to how the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam did it. عن عمر بن الخطاب رضي الله تعالى عنه قال سمعت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يقول إنما الأعمال بالنيات وإنما لكل مري منوى فمن كانت هجته إلى الله ورسوله فهجته إلى الله ورسوله ومن كانت هجته فمن كانت هجته إلى الدنيا يصيبها أو امرأة ينكحها فهجته إلى ما هجرا ما هجرا إليه رواه بخاري ومسلم. In this hadith is the hadith of Umar bin Khattab رضي الله تعالى عنه who said I heard Allah's messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم saying deeds depend upon intentions and every person will get that which he intended. So whoever migrates for worldly benefits or for a woman to marry, his immigration will be for that which he migrated. Bukhari and Muslim. Ruahu, Bukhari and Muslim. Narrated in Bukhari and Muslim. In this hadith of the Prophet wasallam, the Prophet wasallam explains that behind every deed there is an intention. Meaning we don't just do deeds without an intention. And... It's difficult for us to even imagine doing any deed, even if it's not Islamic or related to Islam, without some sort of intention. Most everything we do, there is an, in, uh, an intention behind that action. If you start walking this way, because you probably want to go to the restroom, or you want to go to the kitchen, akramakum Allah, or you want to uh, grab something to eat. You go, you take something to eat. Why? Because you intend to uh, fulfill your need, your, your hunger, or to drink something because you need to fulfill your thirst, quench your thirst. So these things, they require intention. Likewise, and more importantly, that every deed, every deed, meaning the deed, we're talking about things that were rewarded for in Islam, has an intention, should have an intention if you want the reward from Allah Azza wa Jal. And in the hadith that was mentioned, the Prophet said, Every action is tied to an intention. When the Malikul Limri and Manawa. 
and everyone will get that for which he intended. فَمَنْ كَانَتْ هِجْتُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ فَهِجْتُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ Whoever makes the hijrah, whoever makes the migration to Allah and His Messenger, then His, me- then his hijrah was for Allah and His Messenger. Meaning that He did that action to please Allah and He will be rewarded by Allah. And hijra is one of the greatest deeds that you can do. Meaning leaving the land of disbelief to the land of belief. Or leaving the land of bid'ah to the land of sunnah. Or leaving the land of shirk to the land of tawheed. Or migrating to a place where you can practice your religion better. That's one of the greatest deeds you can do. And that's why Allah mentions that in Surah Al-Baqarah in the ayat. Uh, where Allah mentions that the, the malaika that they will be uh, that a person will be questioned by the uh, by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about how they practice their religion you know where where were they weak and oppressed in the land and they uh, remained weak and oppressed or were their souls taken by the angels in a place where they made hijra, where they could practice their religion. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this in the Quran, and the scholars mention that this act of hijra, as they differ over it, some say that it's an obligation to leave the land of disbelief to the land of belief. Some bring the details that as long as you can practice your religion, your faith, you have freedom to practice your faith, then it is still recommended that you make hijrah, but not an obligation. But others say that, so, but they all agree that if you cannot practice your religion in a place, for example, they ban you from wearing the hijab, they oppress you, they put you in jail for practicing, you can't pray, whatever the situation may be, then it becomes an obligation for you to make hijrah if you are able to do so. If you are able to do so. Then the Prophet Sallallahu says, so whoever migrates for worldly benefits or for a woman in marriage, meaning that there's other reasons people can migrate. Some people they migrate because, for example, look at what's going on in Syria. You can call that a mass migration. The people have left their land, which they're being killed and slaughtered and oppressed by the various fighting parties, whether it be Al-Qaeda, whether it be uh, Daesh or the Islamic State, or whether it be the wicked tyrant, devil, demon, shaitan, uh, Bashar al-Assad, who is a kafir, a wicked devil kafir, who kills Muslims, whether it be any of those parties, or whether it be the uh, Hizb shaitan, they call themselves Hezbollah, they are a, a, a Shia uh, militia that is from Lebanon, that is funded by Iran, that uh, fights Ahl Sunnah and kills Ahl Sunnah. So whether it be any of those groups, they've caused discord and harmony and mass killing in places like Syria. It's, a bro- it's broken down. All law and order, all life ceases to exist pr- practically without any safety. And so the people have made hijra. They have left their land to other lands. Some of them went to other Muslim lands and some of them went to non-Muslim lands even. And so this, sh- this is a real example on a mass scale of, of hijra because of fitna, because of the chaos and because of the trials and tribulations that people are going through. So people migrate for different reasons. They also, some people migrate for business. They go to other lands, they might even go to a non-Muslim land because they want to do business. Or they want to get the nationality. Or they want to... Or someone migrates because they want to get married. They go to another land. Maybe they even go to a non-Muslim land because they want to get married. So. The Prophet ﷺ mentioned, so whoever migrates for worldly benefits or for a woman to marry, his migration will be that for which he migrated. Meaning that, that his reward 
will be in accordance with that which he migrated. If he m migrated for something that is halal and something that is, uh, he migrated to, to make the hijrah for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, leaving off a place he couldn't practice his Islam to a place he could practice Islam better, then this person will be rewarded with a great reward. But the one who just makes migration because they want to do business, they've done something perhaps which is mubah, something which is permissible, but yet they might not receive ajr for that. And definitely not the same ajr. So the point is, is that whatever action you do in Islam, it depends upon your intention. And an example, to show you one example, for example, the person who makes wudu, okay? The person who makes wudu, if they make that wudu in accordance with the Sharia, in accordance with uh, how it's mentioned in the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet wasallam, how he sallallahu alaihi wasallam made it, and they have the intention to remove the hadith, remove the the impurities from themselves. You know, maybe they pass gas, maybe they use the bathroom. They're preparing themselves for salat. They have this intention. Then they'll be rewarded for that. But if they made the same wudu, exactly the same, they clean their nose and they clean their mouth, and sometimes you get in a habit of just making wudu, because that's what you usually do. You wash your hands, you wash your mouth and your nose out, and you wash your hands from your, to your elbows, and then you, and you wash your face, and you wash, wipe your head and your, your ears, and you wash your feet. If you do that just to clean those parts, and you didn't have the intention, then you will not receive the reward for that. And that shows you the difference between having intention and not having intention. And that's what this hadith is illustrating for us. That if you do this same action with no intention to, to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but instead it was, it was just to clean those areas, then your wudu, as some of the scholars mention, uh, will not be accepted. And so it's very important for us to know that, that the, the niyyah, the intention, separates something from being the adah or the habit or the custom to the, to, uh, between that and ibadah and worship. The same action, if you make ghusl, you make ghusl because you want to prepare yourself for prayer, you need to, then you'll be rewarded. But if you make that same ghusl, and you didn't have any intention, then you will not be rewarded for that because it will not do the same thing. So you have to make your intention when you're making your ibadah. And something very important, intention, the niyyah is in the heart. It's not in the tongue. So you don't have to say, I intend to pray for a rakat for dhuhr prayer and Allahu Akbar. La, you don't. Instead, it's in your heart. Some people, there are Muslims, many Muslims out there, who do do this. You'll find them in, in the masajid around the world. That they make their niyyah out in the open, which is a bid'ah, as the ulama say. The scholars of hadith and the scholars of fiqh, they mention that this is a bid'ah. This is an innovation in the religion. And the Prophet ﷺ said, مَنْ أَحْتَثَ فِي أَمْرِنَا هَذَ مَا لَيْسَ مِنْهُ فُورَدْ Whoever innovates in this affair of ours will have it rejected. Meaning if you do a bid'ah in the ibadah, it's going to be rejected. It's not accepted. So, we learn from this that the intention is very important and your reward will be in accordance with your intention. Some of the benefits uh, that are mentioned here with regards to the hadith uh, is that good deeds are judged by intentions. Your good deeds are judged by their intentions. It's in accordance with your intentions. But of course those deeds have to fit those two conditions with the intention to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and in accordance with what? The sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The second thing that deeds are rewarded accordingly. You know, they have uh, the recording in according to your intention. If your intention was good, bi idnillah you'll have a good reward. Uh, also, the permissibility of migration for worldly reasons. This hadith also illustrates that it's permissible to go for worldly. If you need to go for business, you need you made migration to seek in your rizq in, in another land or what have you. Because many people, they spread Islam this way. Whole countries, Indonesia, who is one of the biggest Muslim countries, even though they have a lot of weak Islam there. But 
it was spread through businessmen from Hadramaut in Yemen. They migrated there doing business and they and their and Islam spread this way. Also, I believe in Somalia as well, because Mogadishu and those places are coastal cities, that it also uh, from the migration of the Hadramis, those Yemenis, to places like uh, in uh, Yemen, that also Islam spread this way. So they started out with something mubah, something that was permissible, and from it came a lot of good. The fourth thing that he mentioned, the pref prefer preferability of migration for the sake of one's religion. So that it's the most, the highest form of hijrah. The Prophet ﷺ mentioned in an authentic hadith as well, that hijrah is from Masia as well. That it, so hijrah, we can say that there are two types of hijrah in the shara. One, which is usually mentioned, is the hijra, as we mentioned, from, from migrating for your religion, migrating from a place where maybe where there's a lot of sin to where there's a place where that has less sin. Or there's a place where there's kufr and shirk and to a place of Islam and tawheed. That's one type of hijra. The second type of hijra is a hijra that the Prophet ﷺ mentioned in the authentic hadith as well. That hijra is leaving off your wicked sins. So this is a type of hijrah too. When the person makes tawbah and they leave off the bad things they were doing, this is also a type of hijrah. Leaving off bad to come to good. So it's also hijrah. It's also great, great reward. And we ask Allah the Almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil and bless us to be blessed with ilm al-nafi, ruskan tayyibu, amal al-mutaqabbilin wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad.